God Network News. Where we give you a new perspective. On events happening in our world today. This is GNN. This is God Network News, episode 47. Welcome, GNN fans, to another episode of God Network News, the podcast that tells you what God's doing around the world, not what CNN tells you, but what GNN tells you is going on in the world. If you're tired of listening to all of that crisis network news and you want to hear what God's doing, well, give us a listen. This podcast is proudly listed at podcastpickle.com. In this episode of GNN, uh, we will be continuing with our reading of chapters from the new book, There's a Sheep in My Bathtub. And I hope that you're enjoying listening to these chapters. And again, this is our gift to you, our faithful listeners, as a free audio book to you of this really fantastic, really exciting, new, and innovative book that has come out by Brian Hogan. And again, in the show notes, you can find a hot link to where you can get your own hard copy of that if you wish. There's a Sheep in My Bathtub, Chapter 20, Erdnet's First Foreign Birth. Our fourth child, and very first son was born the very next day, November 2nd, 1994. I really feel the telling of birth stories should belong to those who do the hard work, so here's what happened in Louise's own words, from a letter she wrote to a friend in Nevada. I have been thinking of you a lot lately, I guess because there are a few people I know that have four children and have lived to tell about it. How I wish I could call you. I'll have to make do with the antique art of letter writing. I woke up at 2 a.m. on... I woke up at 2 a.m. on the 2nd of November with mild contractions. I ignored them and went back to sleep. At about 5 o'clock, I got up to see if this was really it. I cleaned the living room and swept the floor while timing the contractions. At 6, I went back to bed to see if I could get some sleep, because I knew I was in for a long day. Brian became coherent enough for me to tell him what was happening, and he showed as much excitement as a slug. We slept until the natives got too restless to ignore any more. I got up and made breakfast for the starving masses. We had homemade granola and tang. Who would have guessed I'd ever consider orange flavoring a treat? After breakfast, I walked over to Magnus and Maria's to tell my Swedish midwife, yes, God loves me enough to send the very best. We were in for a busy day. Anne-Marie, my midwife, was much more excited than Brian had been at 6 a.m. Magnus was astonished I could be so calm about the whole thing. I had a cup of tea with the Swedes and then went home to teach Molly school. I figured home school might be more sporadic after the baby was born, so I wanted to get in one last day. The girls were disappointed. They figured a new sibling was a sure excuse for a holiday. Maria came over later in the morning to ask what she could do, and I sent her out to do the shopping. She came back a little later with the needed foodstuffs, and then took Alice to her house. Alice needed some special attention, and Maria was perfect for the job. Alice, being a connoisseur of fine bathtubs, asked Maria if she could take a bath in their tub. She was as happy as a clam. Molly and I finished school around noon, just after Brian and Melody finished her studies, and I got some lunch together. My contractions had slowed way down. Anne Marie came over, prepared for a long stay. She checked the baby's heart and head. The heart was right on, and the head was still a little high. She could still move it a little. She suggested we go out for a walk. This was exactly what I needed. We took a nice long stroll in the hills behind the city. The baby picked a great day to come into the world. The sky was deep blue with no clouds, and the temperature was in the mid-forties. Seven Celsius. Really beautiful. The walk helped the contractions along. When we got back to our apartment, Anne Marie checked me, and things were really progressing. I had a bite to eat. About this time, Magnus showed up in a rush with all his camera stuff. He was supposed to film the events of the day. He had gotten a frantic call from the mother of our good friend Ghana, who translates for the Russian church. Ghana's mother had told Magnus the baby was born, and he thought he had missed it. We were all baffled. Then Melody came in from playing. Apparently she had gone to see Ghana to tell her what what was happening, but Ghana was at work, so Melody told her mother in fractured Mongolian. Minutes after Magnus appeared, Ghana showed up having 
excused herself from a teacher's meeting. Maria and Alice came back a few minutes later. The house was full now, and my contractions were getting harder and closer. There were already fifteen people in our small apartment when four more Mongolian friends came by to see the show. Anne Marie had brought the video of Anne of Green Gables, so everyone was watching the movie and glancing over at me whenever I looked uncomfortable. The whole concept of privacy doesn't translate well across cultures. I finally asked Anne Marie to shoo everyone not actually related to me out except for Magnus and Maria. Brian remembered that he was supposed to be teaching a Bible study to junior high youth. He offered to find someone else to lead the meeting, but I was happy to get him out from underfoot. By 4.30 my contractions were two to three minutes apart and I was singing through them. My sister had told me this helped in her labors with her two boys. It sure is more fun than boring old breathing. Brian came home around five and Maria and Anne Marie started making dinner for everyone. I had roasted a leg of pig the day before, so we had plenty of leftover meat. The aroma was tantalizing, and it would have been bliss, but the labor pains were killing my appetite. I tried laying down, but my contractions and daughters kept me awake. The girls kept popping in and out of the bedroom to see if the baby was here yet. The next time Anne Marie examined me at 5.30, things had begun to move along. I was eight centimeters dilated. We began to get worried that Carlene might miss the birth. Several days before, we had asked Carlene Curley, the Peace Corps worker in town, to be present at the birth so she could testify the baby is an American citizen for the U.S. Embassy. The consulate had told us they would not issue a passport without a certificate of live birth abroad, and this required the statement of a non-related American citizen to verify that the baby really came from these American parents. Brian asked Magnus to go out and find her and bring her back to save us a red tape nightmare. Just minutes after Magnus rushed across town to check for Carlene at her apartment, Carlene came by to see how we were doing. We asked her where Magnus was, and she looked puzzled. She had no idea. I was even in labor. She wondered why Ghana had left their teacher's meeting in the Foreign Language Institute so abruptly. We had a good laugh over the mix-up, and had to send Maria out to look for Magnus, who was now panicking at his inability to find Carlene. Eventually, everyone was back where they were supposed to be. Carlene also happened to bring pancake batter for the next day's breakfast. She was divinely inspired in this. Carlene had been a real blessing to us. She comes from a large Catholic family and does not hold to the silly cosmic beliefs many Peace Corps workers seem to hold. She also has good morals and an incredible work ethic. At 6.03 p.m., according to Anne Marie's records, I was fully dilated and she broke the water membrane. I immediately felt like pushing. This part is sort of fuzzy for me. I think I pushed three times and Jedediah was born. His head came out and then a hand and then he started crying. Then I pushed the rest of him out and Brian yelled, It's a boy! This brought everyone in the house crowded into our bedroom to see the excitement. Anne Marie checked and declared him very healthy. That was 6.11 p.m. It seemed so much longer to me at the time. The girls were so excited about their new brother. The sound of Melody sobbing, It's a boy! It's a boy! drowned out the congratulations of the adults. Anne Marie measured and examined the baby. All his parts were where they are supposed to be and the correct number. <laughs> he was 52.6 centimeters or 20.7 inches and weighed 8.9 pounds. Getting his weight was difficult, like so many simple things here. We borrowed a huge scale from the church's bakery, but they did not have all the weights for the scale. So Magnus and Brian used canned goods on the one side as counterweights to Jedediah on the other. It made for a funny memory. An hour after the birth, I showered, breaking a Mongolian birth taboo, and was up eating the succulent tasty pork dinner Maria had prepared. I feel like I, I'd really accomplished something. Jed is the first non-Mongolian baby born in the 20-year history of Erdnet City. The local newspaper ran a story about the birth and it is the talk of the town. Brian went right out to get the Mongolian birth certificate. It was really hilarious to have this official explaining that if they were to give Jed a birth certificate, then he might claim Mongolian citizenship. The fear is this could open the door to floods of foreigners moving to Mongolia to have their babies and get in on the wonderful benefits of being a citizen of this country. Brian tried to explain he would probably prefer not to surrender his American citizenship so he could stay the same nationality as the rest of his family, but the guy would not budge. And it's a good thing we did everything right to get the American. Chapter 21 Shock and Awe In the midst of our joy over Jedediah Patrick's birth, no one on our team or in the church marked the fact that we had just entered the gates of hell. 
Satan chose this moment to unleash an intense and violent counterattack against us that would threaten to completely consume everything God had done in Erdenet. During the summer, we had hosted a short-term team from a church in Minneapolis that had some strange beliefs and practices, especially in the area of spiritual gifts and leadership. Their visit had not gone well for the Erdnet Church, and we had been relieved to see them off at the train station. We had never heard anything further from them, so we were shocked to run into four of them a day after Jed's birth. They had come to stay, with instructions from their pastor to start a more spiritual church in Erdnet, and to keep their activities a secret from our team as long as possible. As the only other Americans in the city, the secret was out within hours of their arrival. We tried to talk with them, but they had their orders to work apart from us, and the meeting ended on a sour note. This first real opposition shook us, but we had no idea what was already in motion. A week after the birth, I was strolling across the city plaza, and I was stunned to see four young, smiling American guys taking in the sights. Even with heavy coats on over the distinctive white shirts and ties, it was obvious they were Mormon missionaries. Foreigners of any kind were an unusual sight, and our team had been the only resident gadadhumas in town. Sending up a prayer arrow that they were only tourists, I went over and introduced myself. My heart sank as they told me that they already knew who I was and that they had just moved into an apartment on the other side of town. They had secured teaching contracts at the Foreign Language Institute, where Magnus and Maria also taught English. Magnus found out from the principal of his school she had hired five new English teachers from America. We knew there were four Mormon boys, but we hadn't yet met the fifth teacher, a girl from San Diego, California. It turned out she had come to start a Baha'i congregation in Erdnet. That same week, we heard some Mongolians who had been converted to a Korean cult co commonly called Witness Lee Church, a.k.a. Living Stream Ministry or the local church, had moved up from Ulaanbaatar and had already started a small church on the east side of Erdnet. Part of their practice was to trudge up the hill before dawn and greet the day with screaming praise. This did not endear them to the neighbors who unfortunately thought they were part of our church. It seemed inconceivable that in less than a week we had gone from working completely unopposed as the only church in the city to contending with four groups, three of them cults, all four sects immediately targeted the believers of Jesus' assembly. I sent a teaching on Mormonism versus the Bible through all our home groups and into the daughter churches outside of Erdnet just in the nick of time. The Mormons began their door-to-door -door witnessing campaign the day after our whole church had been exposed to the clear differences between biblical Christianity and the Latter-day Saints. It didn't go as well as they had hoped. They failed to convert even one of the believers. The Mormon church of about 40 that eventually developed was almost exclusively English students, motivated by promised trips to the United States and scholarships to Brigham Young University in Utah. The American ladies, as we called the team from Minneapolis, went right to work setting up their church. It was easy to see what they had found wanting in our approach to church planting. Their method was more a duplicate of the Sunday big meeting approach that characterizes most churches in the West. Our meeting in simple small churches, primarily in homes all over town, must have struck them as weak and odd. They imported a large sound system, electric instruments, not only breaking sound missionary contextualization practice, but also requiring non-existent 110 voltage, and materials for starting a Bible school, and right away gathered a group and began services. They brought a Bulgarian woman who spoke Russian to the Mongolians to help get things rolling because no one spoke Mongolian. They connected with two young women who were deacons in Jesus' assembly, the church we were planting. A real spirit of rebellion and independence erupted in these deacons and began to spread. Within a few days, it seemed as if Jesus' assembly would actually split. We tried to talk with these deacons and their followers, but the offer of instant leadership without any discipleship was too attractive. Odgerl, an elder in training, spent quite a bit of time reasoning with the rebels. The spirits that were working on them caused him to be filled with doubt and completely demoralized. He made plans to abandon the church and move down to Ulaanbaatar to become a babysitter for his sister's family. This was such a shock because he'd been so passionate for Christ. We spent several hours pleading with him to change his mind, but it was like talking to a brick wall. 
there was a strong sense that we were dealing with an entirely different person who merely looked like our friend. Magnus, Maria, and I were at a complete loss. We were almost resigned to losing Odgirl when Bayada spoke up. She said, I don't think talking to Odgirl will do anything. We need to pray and command this spirit to leave. Talk about being humbled. Instantly we realized we were experiencing a spiritual attack, not a human crisis. We surrounded Odgirl and Bayada let out in prayer, rebuking the demon and commanding it to quit oppressing our brother. After about fifteen minutes of praying, it left, and Odgirl began to sob. He repented and shared how he felt compelled to leave, even though he didn't want to go. Despair had covered him like a blanket. He felt cleansed and wanted to go immediately on a two-day retreat for fasting and prayer in the countryside. We blessed him and sent him off. A year and a half later, Odgirl would be appointed elder and pastor of the church in Erdnet. So in hindsight, we should have expected a battle like this over him. Our team gathered with the rest of the church leaders and prayed hard, asking God to open the eyes of those in rebellion and limit the spread of damage through the rest of the body. About three days later, all those who had left with the two rebellious deacons returned, repenting in tears. God had healed the split, but we were all shaken by how close we had come. At the same time, both our family and the Alphonses came under the threat of eviction from our apartments. Our old friend, Sukbot, now in charge of the housing authority, was infamous for being quite wicked and taking bribes. She could be paid to snatch a family's home and award it to the one who bribed her. Apparently, she had buyers for both of our team's apartments. Sukbot sent word that we should hand in our house books and move out. We refused, and later received notice that she was having us evicted. We discovered a Mongolian law making it illegal to evict anyone between September and May due to the harshness of Mongolia's winters. Our hopes soared, but then fell again when we found out the cops were in on the dirty deal. Sukbot had bribed the police to do the eviction job. We had friends go and fight this eviction at City Hall, but no one was motivated to cross this woman. She went on a break out of town, and we were told that the evictions would take place upon her return. Living under the strain of impending eviction would be stressful anywhere, but in Asia's deep freeze with four children and one a newborn, stressful doesn't even begin to describe it. Daily battles with red tape to try and foil this woman's plans were also wearing us down. All the other attacks against the church made the overall situation seem impossible. Around the middle of December, the housing Tsarina returned and put the wheels in motion. It really seemed as if we would all be in the hotel for Christmas with our belongings on the street when Magnus had a scathingly brilliant idea. We sent word to the police that they were welcome to come and evict us at any time. We were going to videotape the proceedings and cooperate in every way. They demanded to know why we were going to film them. We informed them CNN would probably find the tape interesting and do a story on how Mongolians were breaking their own laws in the mistreatment of their foreign guests. The police immediately decided the fallout from this was a higher price than the bribes they'd received and pulled out of the deal. Sukbot had paperwork but no muscle and so, no apartments for her buyers. After a month of tension and red tape, it was over. I felt as if our team was playing that whack-a-mole arcade game where you have to keep hitting the moles that pop endlessly out of holes. As soon as we resolved one crisis, another popped up. Right after we saved our apartments, Oyun, not a real name, a girl who had been serving as leader of the worship team, had to be confronted about sexual sin with one of the young hooligans who had been part of the church. This young guy had never made any effort to enter into the life of the church, but had been a fixture on the outskirts for some time, like a wolf around a flock of sheep. Oyun was resistant at first, but finally softened and confessed. Baeta and Maria prayed through her repentance with her and extended her grace, but it was clear we were going to have to think through what should happen when leaders fall into sin. As we sought God and His Word and shared with each other in the elders-to-be, we came up with a restoration plan for these situations. The leader who fell and repented would be removed from public ministry for a period of several months. This was a time for getting closer to God and being discipled by church leadership. There was also a requirement for those in leadership to publicly confess at whatever level was appropriate. 
For example, a regular believer would confess to their house group, a deacon would share their repentance at a deacon's meeting, and an elder would repent before the entire congregation. Oyun was happy to do anything to make things right, both with God and with her brothers and sisters. We all saw immediately how individual sin could hurt the whole church, as her fellow deacons wept while she shared with them, and then later as we limped through worship at our celebration meetings without Oyun's musical skills. We hoped she would be restored enough by Easter to lead worship at the Easter celebration. The attacks had just begun. Too many horrid things happened to our team and Jesus' assembly during November and December to be recounted here. One of the most disheartening was finding that two of our top leaders had gone to a party and allowed old friends to cajole them into drinking too much. Several in the church had witnessed their drunkenness, and we were left with more tearful and repentant Mongolians under church discipline and restoration. At home was the added stress of a new baby. Jed, a fussy and difficult baby, had not once allowed us a night's sleep. He was an incredibly light sleeper and woke up screaming on occasions too numerous to recall. On top of the mental distress of sleep deprivation, we were all suffering from the cold. Outside, the mercury never poked above negative 20 Fahrenheit, while inside, our ground-floor apartment was an ice box. Frost gathered on the inside of our door in December and was not to go away until March. On one occasion, Louise knelt to wipe up water splashed onto the kitchen floor while she was doing dishes. Instead, she had to pick it up and put it back into the sink, already frozen solid. One day, I noticed that the outside door to the basement under our flat had been left open. I went to close it to increase the insulating properties of this room of dead air right under our apartment. What I saw would have made me cry if I hadn't laughed. A pipe had been dripping and the resultant ice flow had filled the room from floor to ceiling with an enormous stalagmite. It was so huge that at its base ice completely filled the room. No wonder we were freezing up above. We were camped on a glacier. As a result, we had to wear sweaters and coats inside the house and keep several borrowed heaters going round the clock. When I went to pay my electric meter bill, the man refused to believe that a single apartment could consume so much power. As much as a school, he groused to me. Only Alice seemed immune to the effects of the cold. She danced around the apartment in a bathing suit and wiggled out of any other clothes we put on her. Mongolian visitors were horrified and would chase her with blankets. The constant numbing cold and spiritual attacks wore us down. Just after the middle of December, Louise and 6.5-week-old Jedediah got out of town for a bit of a break from all this. They went down on the train to Ulaanbaatar with Magnus and Maria. Louise took the opportunity to take the baby to a missionary doctor there. Dr. David Meese cheered us with the news that Jed was perfectly healthy and in the top percentiles in all measurements. Another ray of bright light appeared to cheer us. Bible school in Abakan, Siberia, had sent a young Russian couple to work with our team. Ruslan and Svetlana were full of faith and fire, and we loved them from the first. Svetlana had been the leader of the team who'd kicked off the Holy Spirit outpouring in Miracle April, and now she was back with a husband, a baby in the womb, and a long-term calling to Mongolia. As wonderful as these reinforcements were, they couldn't hide the hard facts we were facing. We had been taking a beating for two months that had shaken both our team and the church. The attacks on Odgetel, Oyun, and the church split had only been the opening volley. Many others had begun to fall away, fall into sin, come under oppression, or give way to bitterness and anger. There were so many things going wrong, we were not at all sure the church would survive. Towards the end of December, our team met in tears and seriously considered whether withdrawal wasn't the best option. It really seemed as if there was no recovery from the deep hurts the body had sustained. We were unable to come to a decision about staying or leaving, so we were stuck with struggling on until we knew better. But we were all bone-weary and running out of hope. Things just didn't seem as if they could get much worse. But they were about to do just that. Chapter 22 The Letter The sun defied all my expectations and came up that Christmas morning. Just twenty-four hours earlier we had awakened to a horror that Christmas Eve and Christmas Day never broke. 
I got out of bed and went straight to the desk, knowing somehow I had to communicate what was happening to friends and family back home. Christmas Day, 1994, Erdenet, Mongolia. Dear family, today is Christmas Day. Yesterday, our son died. This letter will be tough to write. I usually enjoy writing you, and the words flow easily. There are no words for this. Yesterday morning, Louise woke to find a perfect baby boy lying dead in his bed. Jedediah was fifty-two days old. I wish you could have known my son. I wish you could have held him and seen how beautiful his hands, eyelashes, lips, everything was. He learned to smile in his last week. He had a smile more gorgeous than a sunrise. Jed used to stare so intently at our faces, just as if he was memorizing every detail. I don't understand this sudden infant death syndrome. I know that whoever named it never lost a baby to it. The name should reflect that something in the parent suddenly dies. I have heard a few facts which provide a sort of cold comfort. Our living in Mongolia had nothing to do with this. The highest prevalence of SIDS is in New Zealand, a western country. It usually strikes healthy boys under six months during the winter. Jed had a full checkup by an American doctor just a week before he died. He was perfectly healthy. Yesterday was the longest day of our lives. Louise woke and noticed that it was 6 a.m. and Jed hadn't awakened her all night. She knew. Her scream woke me to a nightmare that I have yet to awaken from. I ran to where he was sleeping and picked up my only son. Jed was not there. I prayed for God to raise him from the dead. He didn't. Louise and I wept in shock and disbelief. The girls woke when Louise had screamed, but had obeyed my command to stay in bed. They were calling to find out what was wrong. I had to go in and hold them and tell them that their little brother was dead. I won't even try to describe this. Louise went to get Magnus and Maria. They got up and came immediately. Praise God for our team. There is no way we could have walked through this without them. Magnus and I labored over Jed's body again in anguished prayer. I knew and know God could return life to Jed, but I began to realize the answer this time was that this body was no longer a vessel for Jedediah's life. Later, a few Mongolian Christians and a Russian man, Ruslan, who had just arrived to join our team and help me with the Russian church, came to pray over the body again. While they were praying, God told me to say goodbye to my son. At the same time, he gave Magnus a vision. There was a river with a waterfall next to a wide green lawn. Jedediah, looking about five years old, was kicking a big colored ball around. Magnus looked to see where he was kicking it and saw Jesus. Jesus was playing with Jed. Jed turned around and flashed his beautiful smile and waved. Then he ran to Jesus. We waited almost all day for the ambulance. The hospital insisted one parent accompany the body at all times, so when it came I rode to the morgue holding what had been my son, even knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt Jed was with Jesus, leaving him on that gurney in that horrible place was perhaps the most difficult thing I've ever done. No doctor was on hand, so we are still waiting for a death certificate before we can bury him. We don't know where they will let us bury him. We've been told not to ask. Just go privately into the hills with a few friends. It is sometimes easier to apologize than to ask permission. Later that day was the Mongolian Church Christmas Eve dinner party. We decided to let only a few of our closest friends and leaders know what had happened. At the end of the party, Magnus made the announcement and began to explain. We were all spending the night at Magnus and Maria's, and the Spirit prompted me to walk over to the party. I walked in just as Magnus finished telling the church Jed had gone home. Everyone was weeping as I went up and shared our pain and our hope and faith. We have family here in Mongolia. We called Magnus's boss in Ulaanbaatar, and he informed all our friends there. He and Rick Leatherwood immediately dispatched two close women friends of ours to Erdnet by Jeep to be with us. Helen and Joy have been a huge blessing, as has Carlene, our Erdnet Peace Corps friend. We deeply love and appreciate you, Brian, Louise, 
Melody, Molly, and Alice Hogan. Chapter 23 The Worst Christmas Ever History has shown that throughout the ages, whenever the kingdom advanced, someone first had to pay a terrible price. Bill Butler the Foreign Language Institute, where Magnus, Maria, and I taught English classes, had had its first Christmas party on the evening of December 23rd. We'd all walked over to the party to enjoy the festivities with our students. The mood had been happy and festive, and conversations provided many opportunities to share the true reason for celebrating this holiday. Our friend Carlene, whose Peace Corps job was teaching English at this school, had worked very hard at training the entertainment for the party. The language student's spirited song and dance rendition in English of Rockin' Around the Christmas Tree had had us almost falling out of our chairs with laughter. Jedediah had been the real show stealer, though. Mongolians love babies, and he'd been passed from person to person all over the crowded room. We'd kept a watch on him from where we were seated, not wanting him to be overwhelmed. It was easy to spot his bright blue Mongolian Dell. A lady in my architecture firm had made it for Jed as a birth present, and it fit perfectly. His tasteful choice of elegant native dress had been wildly popular with the Erdnet High Society, at least among the English student and teacher set. With all the attention and passing around, Jed had stayed amazingly peaceful. He hadn't cried once, and many remarked on what a good baby he was. Of course, they did it in the acceptable Mongol way to compliment an infant or child. Mohaihuhit, which translates as ugly child, is actually praise designed to avoid demonic attention. When the party ended, our team had walked home together through the frigid December night. Louise had Jed sleeping, tucked away in the baby sling, hanging across her chest and inside her warm coat. The city had been very quiet. Christmas was not widely celebrated in Mongolia. The Institute had wanted the party merely for a cultural experience. The only ones in the entire city who planned to celebrate the Savior's coming to earth were the members of our church. As we walked home, down the deserted main avenue, we talked of the church's Christmas party, which was to be the very next night. Louise had written a song called Lullaby for the Baby King, which our family had been planning to sing at the party, excited at the added meaning of holding a new baby while singing these lyrics. While we were discussing party plans, Louise slipped on the icy sidewalk and fell smack on her bottom. Amazingly, Jed hadn't woken, and Louise, beyond her sense of coolness, was uninjured. Our apartment was the first one our little group had come to, and we hugged good night and let ourselves in while Magnus and Maria walked on to their building, another five minutes' walk. I'd put our sleepy daughters to bed in their room while Louise nursed Jed in the living room near his bed. Warm with thick wool carpet, sheepskin fleece, blankets, comforter, and warm footy pajamas. We were trying to get him used to sleeping through the night. It would be the second night we'd let him cry himself to sleep. We were hoping his protests about not being in bed with us and about wanting to be held and fed each time he woke would be less this time than the first night we'd tried it. But after Jed had finished feeding, he was really happy, and as we lay him down on his bed, he beamed the biggest smile at us his first ever. He even kept smiling while I got the camera out and snapped a photo. We wanted to take more pictures, but not wanting to lose that good mood, kissed him good night, turned off the lights, and crept softly to our room. Louise told me to leave the camera out to remind us to take more pictures in the morning. Now that he can smile, it should be easy to get some great photos, she'd said. For the first night in two months, Louise and I slept like logs. Around six in the morning, Louise had suddenly awoken. She immediately knew something had gone dreadfully wrong. Rushing out to the living room, Louise flips on the lights. There is no movement from the covers on the floor. Louise pulls off the blankets and sees Jed lying face down, as we'd left him, but something about his head looks wrong. She reaches out and touches him. She feels absolutely no warmth. She pulls his stiff form up against her chest and just knows. Time stops. Louise hears herself scream, but can't feel herself do anything at all. I jolt bolt upright in bed at the sound. I'm running for the living room and meet Louise in the hallway. I hear, Jed is dead, 
and my world caves in. I can't breathe at first, but I hear the girls calling out from their room and make myself tell them to stay put. I go to the body of my son and pick him up as Louise crawls back into our bed and slowly coils into a fetal position, moaning. She chants one thought over and over and over in her head. God is good. God is good. God is good. I hold my son's body and know he's gone. I begin to ask God to bring Jedediah back from death. My daughters are crying and scared, but they obediently stay in their room. Their sobs tear me away from the edge of the pit where I am teetering. I go to the room which my three living children share and sit down on the lower bunk. I hold all three of them as I tell them that Jed has left us during the night and has gone to live with Jesus. You mean he's dead? asks Melody, her face already drenched with tears. My heart is breaking for the second time in less than ten minutes. I nod. Wailing breaks out from Melody and Molly, and I join them. Alice, too young to understand, is crying from fear and sympathy. This, I decide, is the worst moment in my life. Louise appears in the door and announces she is going to get Magnus and Maria. The girls and I just huddle and cry and pray and wait for her return. I feel like maybe I should be doing something, anything, with Jed's body, but I can't think of anything more useful than holding my daughters and grieving with them. Louise has gone into shock. She can't feel the negative 30 degree centigrade cold of the Mongolian winter morning. She's numb inside herself and she stumbles through snow and ice. When she reaches the door of the Alphonse's fifth floor flat, she has to lean on the doorbell for what seems like ages to get a response. Magnus and Maria think it's a drunk mistaking his floor and are understandably reluctant to get out of their warm bed. When they finally answer the door, they too enter our nightmare. Louise returns with our deeply shocked and grief-stricken partners. Looking at their faces, I have a perverse thought. Good. I'm not the only one who thinks that this is unspeakably hideous. Someone else feels it, too. I feel guilty for thinking this, but I understand later that this is precisely why we're told to grieve with those who grieve. I move Jed's body to our bedroom, and Magnus and I begin to really pray agonized prayers over it. We are calling on Jesus with all we have to raise my son from the dead. While we pray, I have my eyes open. Unable to keep looking at my son's lifeless body and continue to pray with faith, I look out our bedroom window onto Erdenet's main avenue. The sun is coming up, and I am shocked to see people starting to move around outside, going about their business as if nothing has happened. The stinking world has come to an end, and these people don't even realize it. It's impossible for me to conceive of life just going on as before. I close the curtains and keep howling out, please, to God. While Magnus and I are praying, Molly comes quietly into the room. I stare at her in disbelief at how much grief has changed her. Her eyes are red and puffy, her blonde locks tangled and bedraggled, and the tears still flow down her cheeks. She's grieving for her brother as deeply as any six-year-old has ever grieved. She hasn't stopped sobbing since I told her the news. I worry that looking at his body, as she is doing, might unhinge her. I can't imagine what this has already done to her young faith and impression of God as her heavenly father. I ask her, Molly, can you still believe that God is good? And she answers immediately, Oh, yes, Daddy, and he's here in this room with us right now. As she says this, Magnus and I sense the presence of Christ in such a powerful way. Jesus is in the bedroom. Jesus is grieving with us. I've never felt the Lord's presence in that potent a form before or since. Even though the miracle we sought doesn't come, we begin to feel a hope well up that makes no human sense in our circumstances. Maria is comforting Louise in the kitchen. She's reading to her from the eighth chapter of Romans and urging her to hold on to the fact that God is somehow working things together for good. It seems written for us since we love him and are called according to his purposes. Magnus, the children, and I all join Louise and Maria in the kitchen for some food and to talk about what needs to happen next. We decide that Magnus should tell the elders-to-be and the rest of our team. We are worried about the church. Two solid months of spiritual attacks have weakened the fellowship to the breaking point. How will they cope with seeing their apostles struck down as well? 
since this evening was to be the first ever christmas celebration for most in the church we feel that no matter what we need to delay a general announcement until after the party is over magnus goes out to round up the leaders and ruslan and svetlana our new russian teammates after he leaves i decide to run over to our friend ganas her fluent command of mongolian russian and english is going to be needed as we deal with officials later in the day when ghana comes to the door i tell her the sad news she reacts with violent anger she screams and kicks a chair down the hallway i don't know whether she is enraged at this latest of satan's assaults or if this is just a mongolian reaction to death when she recovers her composure she wants to help in any way she can i send her to city hall to find out what legal procedures we need to follow when i get home the mongolian elders to be are beginning to arrive ruslan and svetlana are already there all have been crying and exchanging hugs with the family we crowd into our bedroom praying i sit on the bed with jed's body in my lap and the others all lay their hands on me or the body they pray intensely it feels wonderful to hear voices calling out in swedish russian mongolian and english imploring god to return life into jed's still body i am thinking that if any prayers could result in a resurrection miracle these are the ones ruslan is particularly impassioned i can't understand very much of the russian but i know from the tone that god is going to require a really good reason not to grant ruslan's prayer the praying goes on and on after some time i hear something very distinctly in my spirit he's not coming back it's time to say goodbye i look over at louise and in a nonverbal way as only married couples can she communicates with me that she's heard the same thing as i begin to try and accept the loss as god has instructed i continue to feel his presence heavy and real I want the praying to stop so that I can stand up and begin to move on to whatever is next, but I can't think of a way to get everyone to take their hands off and stop praying. I feel suffocated, but I don't want to be rude, so I wait. When they finally stop praying, I share what God has told me, and Louise confirms that she's heard the same thing. Magnus shares a vision of Jed and Jesus playing with a ball on a lawn beside a waterfall in heaven. We are tremendously encouraged, and then we all start crying again. Baeta calls for an ambulance, but is told that a doctor has just died and they can't come for some time. Is there only one ambulance in Erdnet? I ask. The Mongol leaders wrap up Jed's body for burial in a long piece of cloth. Then Louise and I wrap him in a final blanket that has special meaning, a hand-knit one from a friend back in the States. We settle in to wait. We talk and pray and share and sip tea with our brothers and sisters. Waves of tears periodically overtake us it becomes the longest day ever magnus goes back to his apartment and phones david andrianov the director of jcs international his umbrella mission agency david has better access to international phone calls in ulaanbaatar and he takes on the task of informing our families back in the states he is so kind and thoughtful to avoid our parents hearing the news of their grandson's death over the phone, he calls the pastor of one of our supporting churches. The pastor doesn't answer, so David leaves a message on his answering machine. Please call me in Mongolia as soon as possible at this number. It is urgent. Miraculously, this pastor calls David, a complete stranger, in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia. David tells him what has happened and asks him to drive over to my mother's house and break the news in person. He is able to provide support when my folks need it. My mom calls Louise's parents and breaks the news to them and to our other supporting churches. Later in the evening, we receive calls at Magnus's apartment from two of our pastors and from our parents. David further blesses and comforts us by sending his car and driver all the way up to Erdnet to deliver two dear friends, Joy McConnell, a nurse from New Zealand, and Helen Richardson, the Leatherwood Children's school teacher. They braved the icy road to Erdenet at a time when few would. We had never been on it. And make it in record time, arriving that evening to be with us. We feel wonderfully mothered in lieu of our par own parents' presence. David continues to serve us by setting things in motion with the U.S. Embassy and Jedediah's American doctor in Ulaanbaatar for the issuing of a death certificate. On that longest of afternoons, we have a surprise visit that is both difficult and strangely helpful. One of the Peace Corps volunteers is a large young lawyer named Roger. 
We had gotten to know him a bit and quite liked him, though his teaching schedule meant we saw little of him. Roger had conceived a plan to brighten up Christmas for the only American children within two hundred kilometers. Ours. Our doorbell buzzes, and when we answer it, we find Santa has arrived. Ho, 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 he booms. Roger has arrived with gifts for the girls. When he sees the tears, and hears the reason for them, he is horrified at his timing. We spend a lot of time reassuring him and telling him that there is no way he could have known. The thought is very sweet, and it lifts the girls' spirits as nothing else has done all day. Bells jingle as Roger respectfully removes his red and white St. Nick cap. Santa's now in the house, crying with us. While we are comforting Santa Claus, Bolertuya and Bayada quietly and lovingly go about preparing Jed's body to be taken to the morgue. I don't know what they're doing exactly, but when we go into the bedroom again, we find his body is bound and swaddled as any Mongolian baby would be, and the whole bundle is wrapped in a Sesame Street blanket. We are so grateful for these quiet and loving gifts of service. We have been told to wait for the ambulance and not to leave the house. Frequent calls to the hospital let us know that it would be as a long wait as the doctor's death had thrown their systems into disarray. Finally, as dusk is falling, the ambulance arrives in front of our stairwell. Mongolian law stipulates that a parent must accompany the body of a child until it is signed over to the morgue. I carry Jed's body and get into the ambulance with our friends, Ghana, Bolertuya, and Baira. The ride across town to the hospital is eerily quiet. What do you talk about when driving to a morgue? We pull up in front of a small, stand-alone, single-story brick building behind the hospital. This is the morgue. The driver unlocks the metal door and explains that I need to take my son's body in and place it somewhere inside. I think these are very strange and unspecific instructions until I go inside. There are dozens of dead bodies lying on every available platform. It is a charnel house. I am surrounded by death. My heart sinks to a new low as I contemplate having to leave my precious son in such a place. I feel like I'm abandoning him. I search for a place and find a small rolling metal table with nothing on it, and sobbing now, lay down my small bundle. His Sesame Street blanket is the only color in the room. The contrast is stark, and I feel like I might not survive this room of death. I emerge from that place with a look on my face that causes all three friends to hold me and cry again with me. As we ride in a cab back across Erdenet, I ask why all those bodies are piled in there. My three friends are surprised that I don't know that winter burial in Mongolia is next to impossible because the ground is frozen. You simply can't get a spade into the ground to turn it over. I'd never thought of this. How would the authorities dig a grave for my son, I wonder? Or would I have to do it? This thought overwhelms me. I silently tell God that he has to figure all this out for me. I can't do it. The cab stops in front of a large elementary school in our district. All three girls get out, and I remember that the church's Christmas party is starting, and that they have to dry their tears and go in there as if all is well. I pray for courage for each of them as the cab delivers me at the base of the stairs to the Alphonse apartment where our family is spending the night. None of us has any desire to stay in our own place. Louise, the girls, Maria, Joy, and Helen are all there when I arrive. Magnus has just left for the Christmas party. The plan is to tell the church the bad news after the party finishes. As we sit, share, talk, and nibble away at Swedish Christmas goodies, I keep feeling that I'm in the wrong place. I try to push the thought away, but it stays there, intruding on my grief and my time with family and friends. As I think about where I should be, I tell everybody where I wished that I could be. This would be so much easier if we could only be with our parents in California. It really seems as if the hardest part is bearing this awful experience at the ends of the earth, so far from home and family. I think of how my mother always knows just what to do for the girls, and how wonderful her presence would be for them and for Louise and for me. Louise is having many of the same longings for her family. We are overwhelmed with homesickness. In the midst of these thoughts, it comes to me, again, an impression that I am needed elsewhere. Suddenly I'm unable to crowd out the thought any more. I know God wants me to leave the warm apartment and trudge over to the Christmas party. No way, I say to God. Father, that's really asking too much. 
I can't go to a party tonight. I'm not sure when I will ever feel like a party again. I don't want it to even be Christmas. I can't believe you want me to do this, considering what I've just lost. This was my only son. I've no sooner formed this thought than I realize with horror the answer that God could give me, but gracefully doesn't. I know something about losing an only son, Brian. And for me, it all started at Christmas as well. He doesn't need to say a thing. I tell everyone, there's some place I need to be. Please pray for me. I go out into the entry hall and put on my winter survival gear. Sweater, jacket, heavy coat, gloves, scarf, extra socks, boots, and stocking cap. I reluctantly step out into the bitter cold. When I arrive at the multi-purpose room at the school, I see that everyone is gathered at the far end. Just then, a collective sobbing breaks out. Everyone is crying, and when someone spots me, I am suddenly surrounded by weeping Mongolian brothers and sisters. Magnus had just made his announcement as I was coming in the doors. As we huddle together, grieving and holding each other, I realize that God has answered my complaint. I had longed to be with my family. He had created family for me here, in this room, right at the very ends of the earth. There's a Sheep in My Bathtub, Chapter 24, Hope Can't Freeze. Christmas Day came and went in a blur. Other than getting up early, going back to my apartment and writing that letter, I can't remember much that happened that day. I know the kids opened presents, but I can't picture it at all. Missionary friends were my only memorable gifts that Christmas. Rick and Laura Leatherwood and their four kids came up on the train. Lance Reinhardt and Don Caldwell arrived on the same train. Don's was a face from home. In fact, we were sent by the Los Osos Christian Fellowship. We'd mobilized her through perspectives back in 1989, and she was working with street kids in Ulaanbaatar. Don had been up to visit before and was a favorite of the Erdnet believers, as she trained and encouraged the drama team. In younger days, Don had been an actress on stage and in film. In younger days... She'd had a speaking role as Don Damon in the 1970 film M.A.S.H. Auntie Don was adopted family, and her presence took some of the sting away from going through this so far from home. These brothers and sisters put their lives on hold to surround us with love, comfort, and practical help beyond the burial. Practical details kept demanding attention. The question of what to do about burial proved particularly vexing. None of the options seemed very comforting or even acceptable. We began to realize that as much as we were committed to adapting to our adopted culture and doing things the Mongolian way as much as possible, sometimes we had to draw the line. In three areas we were unable, or unwilling, to give up our own culture's ways. Birth, death, and breakfast. Every culture prescribes its own very distinct ways of how people should come into the world, Suggesting new and intriguing practices to a woman who is in labor is not recommended. Every culture prescribes its own distinct ways of how people should leave the world, as we were soon to discover, and no culture other than the Mongolian one offers you sheep's head to eat before noon. We knew we wanted to bury Jedediah in Mongolia. He had lived his entire life there. The farthest he had ever been away from Erdnet was the brief trip to Ulaanbaatar for a medical checkup with a missionary doctor. Whatever significance and connection his brief life had was with Mongolia. Though our embassy offered to help with the details, the ordeal of transporting his body to the United States seemed both unnecessary and inappropriate. Jed's body belonged in the soil of Mongolia, his country. There was a city cemetery just west of Erdnet city limits, and we were assured a plot would be made available to us. As we talked with the believers, it became apparent that we would not be in control of the funeral or anything that followed. Buddhist priests had taken over the caretaking there, and they conducted the rituals for all those interned in that cemetery. Louise and I didn't really want those rituals performed at his grave that might set an example for others. An older believing couple came by to share in our grief. They had lost a child as well to what was probably undiagnosed SIDS. We were blessed by their visit, and we were all comforted in sharing our grief, old and new. Then, trying to be helpful, they offered a suggestion for the burial dilemma. 
they began by describing the traditional Mongolian open-air burial practice to us. Before the 1921 revolution, the unclad corpse was usually placed on a cart pulled by horse or cow and driven out to an uninhabited area that even nomads didn't use. These places are sacred and only visited for funeral-related events. In other areas, especially in South Mongolia, the corpse was placed on a horse, and upon reaching a lonely spot on the steppe, the horse was urged to gallop until the corpse was thrown off. This way, the ghost is rendered incapable of following the bereaved home. In both practices, the body is then returned to nature by being devoured by hungry birds and animals. Not seeing our growing looks of horror, they then excitedly describe the modern synthesis of these ancient customs. You're lucky the law just changed, they told us. These days, the body is driven out to the remote and lonely spot in a car. Upon arrival, the body is placed on top of the car, and the funeral party gets back inside. Then everyone covers their eyes, including the driver, while the driver floors it and the vehicle lurches off across the steps. The body falls off and no one knows exactly where it is. The dogs, vultures, and wolves then tear it to shreds and eat it. We managed to thank our friends for sharing this option with us but we tried to tactfully explain that we would be unable to utilize this new freedom due to our own taboos. There's no way I could let my son be bounced off a car roof and left out on the step to be devoured by wolves. I was fairly sure that even having heard about it was going to give me nightmares. I went to bed Tuesday night and couldn't sleep. All I could think about was that my son's body was still in that morgue and we had no decent options for burial. I began to seriously consider whether I could break in that night, take Jed's body, and hike off over the hills to bury him myself. I kept thinking, it is easier to apologize than to ask permission. After spending much of the night in sleeplessness, I eventually talked myself out of the idea. I realized the extreme cold would probably kill me long before I could hack a hole deep enough in frozen, rocky soil. I was so frustrated by my inability to accomplish even this. As his father, I owed it to Jedediah to give him a proper burial. I finally gave it to God, my father, and sleep came at last. The next day dawned, and after breakfast, Magnus and Maria had worked everything out. They had spent several hours at the hospital securing a death certificate, without which the body could not be released. The doctor had initially refused to complete the paperwork because SIDS is not a recognized cause of death in Mongolia, and he flat out refused to check the box for cause of death unknown. He had been insisting on attributing the death to double pneumonia rather than admitting that he knew of no cause. Fortunately, our friend Zagda had gone with Magnus and Maria. Her children had actually survived double pneumonia, and she knew what it looked like. We had gone to her home with Jed for a Christmas party on his last day of life. She got right into the doctor's face and told him that this child was perfectly healthy and there was no way he was going to say Jed had pneumonia. After arguing with him for a while, Zagda noticed the death certificate was completed except for the cause of death. She grabbed it off the desk and told the astonished doctor that they were finished with him and stalked out, Magnus and Maria trailing in her wake. When they gave it to us, the box for unknown was marked. Later, the American embassy arranged for a certificate of death abroad that used information provided by the missionary doctor who had examined Jed a week before his death. The official cause of death was registered as sudden infant death syndrome. The Alphonses and church leaders had already arranged for the morgue to release the body to us, and best of all, they had come up with a plan for how and where to bury Jed. An elder-to-be, an older man named Hlaugla, worked in an elected position as a city official in one of the Gare suburbs. He was able, through his position, to secure us a permit to travel with human remains in a vehicle. The ordinary purpose of this permit was to transport to the city cemetery, but the destination was not indicated in writing. Klauga suggested that we drive out to a lonely hillside where not even nomads would ever camp. We were so relieved. All of the worries of the night were swept away. I placed a call to the bank where I'd taught English, and the bank president immediately made their van and her husband, a driver, available for our use. In the middle of the day, December 28th, Louise, Molly, Magnus, Maria, Lance Reinhardt, Rick Leatherwood, Klauga, Tuvshin, and I all piled into a gray Russian van and drove out of Erdnet with the body of my son. Jed was still wrapped in a crocheted blanket and Sesame Street quilt, stabbing reminders of our own culture, family, and friends back home. We drove out east of the city several kilometers past the train station. 
we turned off the road and went a few more kilometers overland up into some hills to the north. When Flaugva had found a special spot that didn't violate any taboos and would not offend any locals, we stopped and began digging a grave. It was a place that would be really lovely after winter released its grip. There were a few trees, and in four months the hillside would be covered in grass and wildflowers. I started in with a shovel, but discovered at once that without serious pick work, the soil was not moving. It was completely frozen. I was digging rock. I had imagined I would do the bulk of the digging. It seemed like a father's duty, but the reality was I was quickly tired and gratefully handed off to the many willing hands of friends. The job was just as impossible as I'd feverishly imagined the night before. The wind was blowing at least 24 kilometers an hour, and the temperature was a minimum of negative 26 centigrade. That made wind chill factor a bone freezing negative 39 in Fahrenheit or Celsius. Lance was filming for us so that we would be able to include loved ones far away. The wind made a roaring sound that almost drowned our voices out on the video. It was so bitterly cold, Molly, who had insisted on coming with us to say goodbye to the brother she loved so dearly, had to return to the van with her mother and Maria. She would not have survived long outside. The men struggled to hack deep enough into the ground for a decent grave before any extremities were lost to frostbite. It seemed like forever, but eventually we were ready for what would have to be a quick graveside service. I went down to the van and fetched Louise, Molly, and Maria and I carried my son's body for the last time. As we stood huddled around that bare hole in the Mongolian earth, I knelt and laid Jed's shell into his grave. The finality of this action overwhelmed me, and I began to sob as I knelt over the grave. I could hear the others crying around me. Our tears froze on our faces and fell to the earth in Jed's grave, frozen like gems. As I stood up, Tuvshin and Flaug quickly filled in the grave, shoveling back in the dirt we'd just wrenched from the ground at such cost. Our dear friend and mission director, Rick, shared from the words of Jesus from John 6.40, For it is my Father's will that all who see his Son and believe in him should have eternal life. I will raise them up on the last day. We sang a song we'd chosen, There is a Redeemer by Melody Green. I could remember when, years before, I had heard how she'd lost her little ones and husband, Keith, in a plane crash, and thinking, how could anybody make it through losing their child? It seemed appropriate that we were worshipping with a song penned by one acquainted with grief. After singing, we prayed this seed we planted and watered with tears would result in much fruit for the kingdom of God in Mongolia. After we finished our service, I started to wander around gathering rocks to outline the pile of earth. It looked too bare and unloved. The others understood without words and joined me. Before long, the grave was surrounded by rocks and had a rock cross on top. We found a large stone covered with orange lichen, and several of us managed to roll it over so that there would be a headstone. At this point, driven away by the onset of frostbite, we hurried back into the van and returned toward Erdenet. Looking back as we drove away, I could see the grave until it was swallowed from my view by the vast hillside. I thought, that is probably the first Christian grave in Mongolia since the Nestorians were here in the 13th century. It also struck me Jedediah was the first American ever born in Erdnet, and as far as we know, the first American to die in Mongolia. Whatever the historical significance, a piece of our heart was now buried forever in the soil of Mongolia. When we made it back and were dropped off at our apartment, we entered to the bustle and smells of a feast in preparation. The church leaders had come over earlier in the day and told us a shared meal at the home of the grieving family was customarily served to all of the extended family and friends. We told them there was that no way that we could possibly put on a feast in our present state. Even preparing meals for our own small family was beyond us right now. They quickly assured us that they were not expecting anything of us. Mongolian families w would count on the help of relatives who came around them after a death, and the church was our family in Mongolia. They would take care of the feast. Relieved, we agreed. During the burial, we had forgotten that this was happening and were strangely cheered and comforted by a warm flat full of friends and the smells of good food. Before long, a steady stream of guests began to arrive. As they entered, each person handed me a cash gift. I was horrified at first. 
We had lived with the knowledge that as poor as we were, we were far wealthier than almost everyone in Erdnet. Being handed money by people with nothing to spare was hard to take. Bayetta saw my dismay and quickly whispered that I had to accept. It was custom, and there was no polite way to refuse the gifts. I stood there in our entry hall, feeling humbled and astounded by the generosity of these Mongolian people. The apartment was overflowing, but somehow everyone was served. Friends from work and town passed through and left after greeting us and eating something, but many from the church stayed on. As the stream of guests diminished at last, those not cleaning up in the kitchen gathered in the living room with Louise and me. We shared our hope with them as we told of words and scriptures that had been encouraging us over the past few days. Louise and I sang a worship duet in English, and someone led us all in Mongolian worship on the guitar. The time flew by, and before long everyone was leaving to go over and set up the women's palace for the evening's meeting. It was the church's regularly scheduled Old Testament storytelling time, but tonight it was doubling as Jed's memorial service. The day before, Magnus had mentioned that though it was my turn to take the story up at the next day's meeting, he would be willing to carry on alone until I felt up to it. We had been trading off every week, storying our way through the Old Testament. Every Wednesday we'd check how far the other had gotten in God's story and pick up the thread there. I asked Magnus how far he'd made it last week, and he paused. I asked again, and he said in a lowered voice, Abraham is just about to offer up his only son. I was speechless. It hit me how God was in charge of details like this, even on our bleakest days. I told Magnus, thanks, but I think I'm supposed to tell this story. As the last guest left, we went with them over to the rented hall, which doubled on many nights as Erdnet's disco. We walked into a packed room. I walked up to the front and told the story of what God had asked of Abraham. We were not very far into the story before I was getting choked up and many in the crowd were crying. We wept our way through the story somehow, and it felt as if we had all experienced the real story of that ancient grief and loss and redemption for the first time. I tied it all into Christmas and how we understood that the Father had sent that sweet, holy baby into this world knowing he would die here. That was the real and hidden meaning of the holiday we had celebrated so joyfully in the past. Loss and sacrifice are the price paid for joy and salvation. We'd never experience Christmas the same again. I took my seat with Louise and our girls. We were sitting in front next to Auntie Dawn and our Peace Corps friend, Carlene. Rick Leatherwood brought his four kids and our three girls up to lead several children's songs. Mongolians love action songs, and this was a big hit. The mood changed and lifted. It seemed strangely appropriate Jed's homegoing should be celebrated with children's worship he soon would have loved. After Rick finished, Magnus and Maria surprised us all with a song they had been practicing as a gift to us. After Rick finished, Magnus and Maria surprised us all with a song they had been practicing as a gift to us, a beautiful duet of Grave Robber from the Christian rock band Petra. The lyrics captured perfectly where we had been finding our hope since Jed had left. Afterward, we worshipped in Mongolian, and, with the house of the Lord, the vineyard worship song Louise sang throughout her labor just two months before. I went to the front and shared my heart with the church. It was clear we were not going through this alone. The church had been under attack for almost two months, and our team had been having serious doubts as to whether the infant church was going to make it. Jed's had not been the only death. We were all still reeling from a second death that followed Jed's by two days. The day before, a deaf young teen from our house church died of no apparent cause. The doctors claimed that it was kidney failure, but she had seemed perfectly healthy. This was a special child who had always seemed to overcome her mental challenges with an uncluttered spirituality that made others want to experience the father like she did. The shock and grief this caused seemed overwhelming on top of everything we had already absorbed. Death seemed to be all around us. I felt I had to say something to encourage the battered believers. I told them that we had been going through a lot, and I wasn't sure how it all would end, but I wanted them to know Satan had gone too far. He had crossed a line with these deaths. I don't know what any of you are going to do, but as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. We're going to tear away at the enemy's kingdom for the rest of our lives, and if Satan doesn't like it, then he'd better kill all of us. The mood changed noticeably from then on. The church began to return to the fight. 
I sat down again. Magnus shared from the Bible, and afterward everyone gathered around us and prayed for our family. It was both beautiful and hard. The fact that almost all of our son's memorial service was in a language we were still struggling with seemed to increase our painful feelings of separation from parents and home. Both Louise and I were inwardly praying that we would be back in the States very soon. It was not to be. Take a look around me. I'm surrounded myself with negativity, and it's sounding like I will never breathe. And I'm drowning, the bills don't want to leave. I hate working, but cash I must achieve. With snakes lurking, no time for my family. My soul's hurting, this ain't my destiny. That's for certain, there's nothing but emptiness. In the world, only God can fill me up. What is love? But the temptations are strong. I need to pray if you want to change the path you're on. Then say, I need to wake up. I forgot what's important now. Wake up, cause money ain't everything. Wake up, all I do is drink all day now. Wake up, I gotta do it for my family. Wake up, I forgot what's important now. Wake up, I'm losing my sanity. Wake up, got the one that can save me. Wake up. Cheap. I know it, everybody knows it I see their face and they're up to no good Cause they lie, steal, hate, cheat I know it, everybody knows it I ask God humbly, make me a servant I ask for mercy, I don't deserve it Cause thoughts I'm a slave to all perverted And cash is my idol, I need to change I'm always chasing People will kill for that money. There's never enough of that money. There's nothing but misery with that money. There's nothing but emptiness in the world. Only God can fill me up. What is love? But the temptations are strong. I need to pray if you want to change the path you're on. Then say, I need to wake up. I forgot what's important now. Wake up, cause money ain't everything. Wake up, all I do is drink all day now. Wake up. When I just got a new crib I need a bigger one I just got a new job I need a better one I just got 10 G's Already spent it doing what I gotta do to eat It's all a game as I'm walking down the street Things are the same, same song and the same beat On the radio On the TV There's nothing but emptiness In the world only God can fill me up What is love but the temptations are strong I need to pray if you wanna change the path you're Now. 